Hi everyone, I'm Will Johnson, and I'm really excited to talk to you about integrated sensing and robotic skin modules here at IEEE Sensors 2021. Um, so robotic skins combine actuation and sensing in two-dimensional soft robots. Robotic skins are modular and they're reconfigurable, um, so you can wrap them around soft bodies to transform them into robots. In this skin here, um, you can see it's being it can be detached and then reattached, wrapped around something else to transform it into a robot. Um, or it can actually, in the middle frame there, actuate on its own. So the robotic skins have um, capacitive strain sensors. They also have pneumatic actuators. Um, so they can add robotic functionality to different devices. A current limitation with robotic skins is that they're not tightly integrated. So they're quite bulky. The actuators and sensors are attached to a soft substrate um, via these snaps here. Um, and so this introduces failure at the connection points or errors. Um, and it really makes the skins very far from their biological inspiration in biology. Um, lots of things are, are very tightly integrated. So the motivation of this work, the aim is to tightly integrate these components, the sensing and actuation into the skins um, toward um, the biological systems that we aim to rival. So the specific sensing we're looking to integrate into these robotic skins are capacitive strain sensors. So um, as a little bit of background, a two stretchable conductive electrodes separated by a dielectric form a parallel plate capacitor. The capacitance of that sensor is determined by the geometry, the dimension of the electrode, um, the separation distance of the electrode, and the dielectric constant. The capacitance changes when the sensor is stretched, and as long as your dielectric is incompressible and your electrode resistance is sufficiently low, um, this is actually a linear relationship. The capacitance will increase linearly uh, as you stretch your sensor. And so for our electrode material uh, in this work, we use a multi-phase composite, um, which is by volume 40% silicone elastomer and 60% room temperature liquid metal, in this case, eutectic gallium indium. Um, that mixture is then mixed with 1% by volume expanded intercalated graphite. And so at first, the liquid metal droplets are suspended in a silicone matrix and not in contact. After the composite is stretched for the first time, the EIG particles, which are sharp, create these micro tears in the silicone matrix. Um, so the liquid metal droplets can coalesce and form a conductive network. So MPC was really um, desirable for our application because it has a low electrical resistivity. It's capable of high strains greater than 200%, um, and it bonds well to silicone substrates. It retains the properties of its host silicone. And so this was a, a very suitable choice for our sensor material. But I will reiterate that any highly stretchable electrode with a sufficiently low resistance will do the job. Um, so let me tell you a little bit about how we fabricate our modules. So we start with an active skin, um, which is a skin with embedded actuators. You see three actuators in this triangle, one for each side, and they're pneumatic actuators so they can inflate. Um, you can look at um, previous work from my lab to um, see how those were made. Um, but we apply a paper mask to this skin that's a negative for where we want our sensors to be. And then we coat MPC. Um, so we coat a layer and add some wire leads before the MPC cures, which takes about two hours. Um, after that sensing layer cures, the conductive composite, um, we encapsulate the whole thing with Ecoflex 50 silicon elastomer and we add a strain limiting layer. The encapsulant doubles as an adhesive to attach the strain limiting layer. Um, that layer consists of these fabric reinforcements that you see um, in the image, and then these patches that we adhere to it. Um, the patches have unidirectional fibers. So we make the fibers, or we make this composite um, by winding fibers around a drum, encapsulating it in silicone, and then laser cutting these patches. Um, so they're anisotropic in one direction, you can strain them, and it's just like silicone. In the other, it's completely inextensible. So they were originally designed so that the deflection of the actuators can be controlled when they're inflated, but they're actually essential for um, using these capacitive sensors because the capacitive sensor will respond to strain in any direction. If we actually want that sensor to be measuring the side length of the triangle, we need to limit the strain in the transverse direction. So that's what these um, this strain limiting layer is functional for. Um, on 
then the last step for fabrication is you actually repeat everything for the reverse side of the skin. So again, you will apply a paper mask, you'll coat MPC, add wire leads, encapsulate Nicoflex 50, and that encapsulant will double as an adhesive for the strain limiting layer, put it under a weight to cure. Um, and at the end, you have this uh, robotic skin with tightly integrated sensing. You can see the wire leads for the sensors, uh, as well as the pneumatic, the tubes for the pneumatic actuators. Um, so before we can actually use this robotic skin and the sensors for anything useful, we have to calibrate the sensing. So the sensor calibration process was to stretch each sensor on each skin. We had seven robotic skins in total that we used for the work, um, and we uh, stretched each sensor to seven different known lengths and measured the capacitance. We used commercially available circuitry to measure the capacitance, and we repeated that three times. So we had 21 data points for each sensor um, and three sensors per skin. So you see in the plot here, um, a totally linear relationship between capacitance and length for every sensor. The coefficient of restitution was higher than 99%. So we were able to fit a linear model that corresponds to each sensor. And the sensors were highly reliable and repeatable. Here you see a histogram of the residuals from the linear fit in units of strain. And the standard deviation here is less than, or is just, just over 1%. Uh, so we could finally use the sensors to do shape reconstruction experiments. Um, here's our experimental setup with one of the skins placed on a pegboard. There's 12 millimeters of space between each peg, so we know where the vertices of the triangle are. Um, we can measure L0, L1, and L2, the lengths of the sides of the triangle, by measuring the capacitance of the sensor, and then using the linear model we came up with during calibration uh, on the right. Then we can follow experimental procedure from previous work um, and reconstruct the vertex locations of the triangle. Um, knowing the side lengths. So this is what one example, one trial looks like. If the black triangle shows the vertices of the ground truth triangle where we know it is in the pegboard, and the red triangle shows the sensor's reconstruction based on the capacitance measurements. Um, so to quantify our results, we needed to come up with some definitions. So the Euclidean error we define as the planar distances um, between the reconstructed vertex and the ground truth vertex. So that top vertex there has some distance, has some error, uh, and then that vertex that's defined to be on the x-axis also has some error associated with it. Those two together make up the Euclidean error. So it's just the planar distances added together. The vertex on the left has no error because in both the ground truth and sensor reconstruction, that's defined to be the origin. And so um, with that definition, we can quantify the Euclidean error. Um, the right axis says, the Euclidean error in millimeters, while the left, it's normalized by the side length of the unstretched side length of one side of the triangle, which is 120 millimeters. Um, and then you see that for separated by skin on the left, and then a histogram of all the normalized errors on the right. Um, so overall, we had 12% error. Again, that's 12% of one of this characteristic length. Um, and that might seem quite high, even though I told you the sensors were highly reliable and repeatable, which they are, a lot of this error is actually due to the propagation of uncertainty throughout our calculation when we actually reconstruct the vertex locations in this Euclidean error metric. Um, that uncertainty propagates. Uh, this is, we report this because it's the preferred error if you know one vertex location in some robotic application and you want to reconstruct the other two. Um, but if you're concerned with something just the length, um, we also report a parametric error, so the error on the perimeter. If this red dashed line is the perimeter, the sum of the side lengths for the sensor reconstruction triangle, and the black line is the same for ground truth, we define the parametric error to be the distance between those. And so based on that definition, we can make the same plots for parametric error um, for each skin, as well as across all trials, all 140 trials, 20 trials per skin, for seven skins, um, and we get an average error of less than 1% with standard deviation of less than 2%. So um, again, the depending on how you quantify it, the sensors are actually quite reliable with reconstructing um, their lengths, and then you will always have this limitation of error propagation when you go to reconstruct the shape. Um, so in conclusion, um, this tight integration of strain sensors and robotic skins has led to high reliability in shape reconstruction, which we demonstrated 
for future work, we actually have to mitigate a coupling effect that happens between the inflation and the stretching of the sensors. So when we inflate the pneumatic actuators um, in our robotic skins, the sensors will respond differently because they, they both respond to the inflation pressure depending on sensor placement and manufacturing differences between skins. And so right now they can't actually be used to reconstruct the shape for actuated skins only when the skins are stretched by hand or in this pegboard experiment. Um, but this is an important step toward the fully integrated robotic skins with robust feedback control that we envision for the future. So I want to thank you all for um, listening to me and for those that have supported my work. I'm happy to take your questions.